Hi, and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech, the weekly Q&A session. You ask the questions, we give you the answers. Get involved down there um, with all your tech-related questions. Anything old retro goes, anything futuristic tech goes, or if you've just got problems in dicks in your gears, that is perfect. We're here to help. Uh, don't be afraid to get involved down there, please do. Uh, of course, also make sure you go subscribe to our channels as well. You've got to subscribe to us, to EMBN, to GMBN. It's all free content for you, uh, in which case a lot of it is daily as well. So you can definitely benefit from some of that in your feeds. Right, first question this week is from Alco Samwell. How long will lube last? Uh, how many rides or how many kilometers uh, so we know how often to lube our chain? Hey, how long is a piece of string? Um, right, this is a... We get asked these sort of questions a lot. Now, it's completely different for every rider in every climate, uh, according to the products that you're using as well, and how frequently that you ride. Um, but all these things will add on to it. So, if you use dry lube, for example, um, in wet conditions, it's going to wash off, so you're going to need it more frequently. If you use wet lube in dry conditions, it's going to gunk up with stuff all over it, so you're going to need to clean it off more frequently to keep everything running efficiently without wearing or putting additional strain on your transmission there. So, um, it's difficult. I mean, muck off, for example, I don't know if I've got one here. They make a lube called Hydrodynamic Lube. I haven't even got one here. Uh, they say that that lasts 200 miles between applications, which is incredible. Of course, those applications will be um, uh, very specific. So all you need to do really is monitor your chain. Now, yes, in theory, you should be lubing your chain every time you go for a ride, but don't just add lube on top of lube. Now, I'm gonna throw you a link, uh, which is gonna be down there, to a, one of these shows I shot with Lewis Lacey, who is the chain R&D development guy from Muckoff and he knows everything about chains, chain loops, and we spoke explicitly about a lot of these sort of questions. Uh, so please do, if you're struggling with this sort of stuff, watch that video, uh, he will enlighten you to a lot of stuff. Now he wasn't pushing a product, he was just answering everyone's questions. I collated a whole load of questions, all related to chains and lubricants, and I fired them straight at him. So it was actually really good, it was quite candid of him to answer all that stuff, so get involved down there. Okay, next question then is from Matthias Payne. I just bought a new Ibis Ripmo and it comes with a Fox Factory 38. That's a serious fork and a seriously nice bike as well. I've got my sag set at 30%, but it seems there's a bit of suck down, uh, 10 to 15 millimeters perhaps. At the same time, I can't seem to bottom it out. I'm a light dude, about 150 pounds. When a bike is just sitting, should the fork be fully extended? I've tried playing with the purge valves, trying to extend the fork and then equalizing. Any tips? I want to get all of my travel. Um, really, it just sounds like you've got too much air in the negative chamber there. Now, some of this air actually could have got into those lowers, so pushing those purge valves would help. Uh, but sometimes, if this has happened, the best thing for it is literally to pull the lowers off and do a basic lower leg service and take the air chamber out. Now, if you're not comfortable doing this, I wouldn't advise you start it. But one of the things that can happen when those forks are assembled is if they end up with too much grease on the top of the actual sort of the air rod or piston that pushes through, that grease can clog the port that goes basically between the positive chamber and the negative chamber. And that port is essential because that is how the air transfers into negative to fill it in the first place. And if it's not able to sort of transfer between them, you can get too much on the negative side and your fork can start creeping down its travel, which sounds exactly like what has happened to yours. Now, for anyone else out there, if you're wondering about equalizing your fork as well, uh, what you really should be doing is inflating a fork to a, a low PSI, like pound square inch, say 50, 60 PSI. Then you want to compress your fork a number of times, yeah, and then up again from there. Uh, now, most manufacturers will tell you probably I need to do this once, but it's not going to hurt you if you do it a couple of times when you're trying to get to your ideal sag point. Now, you should definitely be able to use all that travel. Uh, I would also check if you've got any volume spaces in there as standard because that will also affect how easy it is for you to use your travel. Now the Fox 38 uses the same style clip-on, they sort of snap together um, volume spaces that go on the top cap. Now to get the top cap off, you're gonna need a socket for that and it's gotta be a flat profile socket. So you don't need the expensive Fox one they make, that's just a posh one in an orange color. Any flat socket will do. 
but don't be tempted to use one that's got those chamfered edges because you will round off the top on there and that's not a good thing. Now you can also use other things, it's not recommended, but you can use things like the Knipex uh, locking pliers that I'd like to use. I've used those many times in the field because they've got machined faces on them. Uh, I would say that they're quite safe to use, but anyone working at those suspension companies will say, you really shouldn't, so a socket is your safest way. Uh, needless to say, remove the air when you do this, use your socket to undo that top cap, and then you have access there. And you can have no spacers, you know, up to like six spaces or so, depending on the model of the fork uh, and the amount of travel that particular model has. Um, that's about it really, I'm hoping that is okay for you. We've done a few videos on this before, there's also one where I fixed a bike, I uh, forget which presenter it belonged to, but I had that exact problem, there's gonna be a link to that floating around down there where I take you through that process. And I think even when I took that, the air rod out with the piston on it, you could see it had a massive blob of grease on the end, so it just accidentally had a bit too much grease put into the fork in assembly. Um, next up is from Christian Snyder, who says, will disc brake cleaner displace water after cleaning like WD-40, uh, for example, given the fact it evaporates quickly, it would make an ideal pre-treatment for lube in the chain. Um, yeah, technically it would do exactly that. Feels a little bit wasteful doing that, but yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure I've used it in a place of degreaser and stuff in the past where I've just needed to get something clean. So yeah, I'm sure you could do that. See, no issue with that. Regular commentary as well. Thank you for following most of, well, pretty much all the videos we, we make. It's uh, much appreciated. Okay, so the next question's from Sparsi, who's got a SRAM level ultimate break, and part of the bleeding edge tool is snapped inside the port. Oh, and the caliper. Oh, dude, that's unlucky. Um, nothing sticking out of the port to grab and twist the piece out. Brake works, no problem. Any ideas how to get this piece out of the port? when it's time to bleed the brake again. Okay, so your brake, your brake is obviously working, that's fine, yeah, and so you won't be able to bleed it with that in there. Now you say you can't get pliers on it or anything like that to get it out. Ah, oh, do you know what, I don't know without seeing it. I, my, my gut instinct would have said to uh, use something like a bit remover that you used to get bolts out with, but it will just spin in there because it's not, you don't use it like that. Has anyone else out there had that problem? Um, I'll tell you what I'm gonna have to do is try and recreate that to try and figure it out. I have got an old one of those with a broken hose on it, so uh, I'm sure I can find a caliper to snap one off in and see if that can work. Oh, has anyone else out there had the bleeding edge tool break on them? I'm really sorry, I can't, I can't give you any more advice than that. You've come here for advice. I haven't even seen that as a problem, that's really unlucky. Uh, if it's working, keep on using it for the time being. Um, I would actually say, go to your local bike shop um, and ask the mechanic, see if they've seen it. It might be a thing that other people have seen, but I've never heard of that. So, uh, yeah, without seeing it myself or trying it. I'm gonna see if I can try one out tomorrow. Um, I'll let you know how I get on. Uh, next up is from Kevin Tesner. After rinsing my chain and letting it dry, I often see little orange spots of rust, even while some parts of the chain are obviously still wet. Um, without waiting days and watching it even get more orange, how do you get the chain properly dry before leaving it? I sat on a porch, cranking the chain backwards over, um, over a heat gun once. I was in a hurry. Uh, it worked, but I felt like the neighborhood idiot. Are the rusty spots a concern, or is it just minor surface rust that can be ignored? Once I lubed it early and actually seemed to rust under the lube, it feels like I can't win. Um, okay, so surface water, basically you need to get it off your chain. So get yourself a decent water displacer. Uh, there's lots of different options on the market. There's non-bike brand related stuff, uh, like the classic WD-40. Um, and there's loads of other options out there. Muckoff have got MO94, they've got Bike Protect, they've got loads of different things out there. So the most important thing you can do, especially with a chain, like you're finding out, is flush that water out. Uh, needless to say, any sprays that you're putting around the bike there, make sure it can't go near a disc rotor. Now, Muckoff do actually make a sort of protector, so if you're the sort of person who's paranoid about this, it can cover everything, so you can literally just go gung-ho and spray on there, but I like to be a bit more sort of considered with it. I put a rag behind, behind the chain as I'm spraying. Um, I've not had this problem for a long time, um, if I'm completely honest, and I had to make a chain rusty for a video recently, and I actually had to try to make it rusty. Um, no, so yeah, a heat gun will do it. Water displacer is your best friend. So what you wanna do is 
Bang the bike up and down a few times, so any sort of standing water that's in it is going to start coming out. Cycle the bike through the gears a few times, give it another bang, and then get your water displacing lubricant spray on there. So it's not an alternative for a lube, this is just there to spray and basically push out that water. Then you want to make sure you towel dry it. So get yourself a microfiber cloth, something like that. Um, you can obviously wash these and reuse them, but when you do have one used in your drivetrain, don't use it on any other part of your bike. Just keep it for that. Um, make a mark on it or something uh, for your own reference there. Um, and basically drying it by hand is the best bet and water displacer. And then you want to lubricate it afterwards. As you found out, if you put lube over the top, any water underneath could still allow corrosion to happen. Um, but if it's just surface rust, I wouldn't be too alarmed about it unless it's literally everywhere. A lot of the time, that will wear off. Uh, and you can also use like a wire brush. I've even used an old suede brush that I had from a pair of old suede boots before to just take off little bits of um, sort of standing rust like that. Um, and I actually made a video all about removing rust from bike products as well, actually. So we're going to throw a link to that. That's going to be down there somewhere. Our helpful AD crew will put that in the comments down there. Um, no need, yeah, for a heat gun. Um, a blower or compressor actually is another option for you. If you've got a compressor for inflating your tyres, you can <laughs> force all the air out. Or as someone else asked, um, I don't know if it was earlier this show or last week's show, you could use disc brake cleaner, which basically evaporates afterwards, but um, I think that's a bit wasteful. I'd save that for cleaning your brakes. Next up is from Daniel Clark. This is a question for a Fox 36 fork. I was just wondering if you can put RockShox 15 weight or 5 weight oil on the stanchions as a lube. Um, yes, you could. That wouldn't be a problem. Um, you obviously don't want to put too much stuff on the stanchions because dust is going to stick to it. I'm assuming it's going to be dusty where you are. Could be muddy if you're from Cairns or somewhere, I guess. But uh, you just say thanks from Australia. Um, yeah, you don't want stuff to stick to them. So the one time you do want to put oil on them is for it to soak into the seal. So for example, uh, remove the garter seal, which is that little metal spring clip. Uh, you can literally roll that off of your fingers. And then if you get like the rounded end, end of a cable tie and just sort of break the seal there, just push it under, then you can use some of that oil just around the top there. Um, remove the cable tie, compress the fork a few times, and if there's any muck under the seals immediately, it will lift it out, and then clean the stanchions off again, uh, and your fork will feel a little bit more supple. Now, fork lower leg lube, essentially you can use anything really, 20 weight oil will be absolutely fine. The reason that manufacturers stipulate having to have a lighter weight lube in your damper leg and a heavier weight in the other leg um, really is so the damper doesn't absorb the wrong oil into the actual system. So all the dampers will be using pretty much, other than the latest RockShox one, most dampers out there on the market will have a sort of a bladder style system. Now these systems are great, unless they start ingesting oil. Uh, so over time, we're talking a long time of riding here, the oil that just sits in the bottom of the fork, just from capillary action will find its way onto this damper as the damper's moving up and down. That oil ingests and gets into the damper, changing the volume on the inside, you start getting basically like poor performance uh, and you'll need to get this serviced. So that's the reason why the manufacturers stipulate running, like say it's a five weight or something, that will be the weight of oil that's in that damper of stock. So if it ingests it into there, it's not really gonna mess it up, but it still will need servicing at some point. Um, that's it really. The other option of course is some sort of silicon spray. I haven't got one handy at the moment. Um, a silicon spray is a lot of companies are doing muck off, it's got silicon shine, uh, some dedicated suspension companies that make them as well, uh, just for spraying on the stanchion tubes. Uh, same thing, compress the fork a few times, lift out any muck, give them a clean over the top there, uh, and that's it. But the important thing is make sure the top of your seals is as clean as possible, the stanchion tubes as clean as possible, and there isn't just oil sat on it, because that will attract dirt and stuff, and because of the telescopic nature of the forks, that dirt is going to end up inside the forks, and then you're going to be looking at at least a lower leg service. Uh, next up, Sunny Jim 93. I'm thinking of swapping my 170 mil travel 27 and a half inch wheel Kotic Rocket for a slightly lighter 150 mil 29er Kotic Jet to make the long long rides easier and faster. I know Doddy likes longer, sorry, shorter travel bikes. Does he ever miss the extra travel of a proper enduro bike? Um, not for our ride, no. Um, but that said, I do have a bigger travel bike. I've got an Orbea Rayon, which is kind of like my enduro bike. That really, I don't do that sort of riding. So here and there, I'll do an uplift day, or if I just fancy going somewhere for a bit more fun. Yeah, a bigger travel bike is, is fun. But really, for most of my riding, even going abroad, I like a shorter travel bike. 
Um, but that's my preference. Now it's never held me back, um, 130 to 150 sort of region, um, front to rear ratio, sorry, rear to front ratio there. Um, seems to be about right. So that Spectral 125, it's obviously 125 on the rear with a 140 fork. The Mondraker that I built for that ultimate bike build, that was 130 on the rear and 150 on the front. So very similar ballpark there. I kind of think that's like the magic number for a trail bike. I think that's like that region just works so well for most things. Now I know there's a lot of viewers out there that will disagree and they'll say no, I prefer a bigger travel bike and that's absolutely fine. Uh, no one's wrong here, I'm just saying what I prefer based on what someone's asked. Um, no, I haven't missed it at all. Uh, and Anna also says, um, I rode a Flare Max in the Alps, Scotland and Canada and it was only on the real janky rocks that she missed the travel and that one was 125 on the rear. Uh, and there's obviously a few photos of her with a bike. Do you know, it's something quite pleasing as well about negotiating some real rough as Anna says, janky stuff on a bike that's just a little bit um, sort of under spec for it as well. And I think you get a lot of respect from people for actually getting through stuff on that. But that's not to suggest that you should um, challenge yourself to do that. It just means there's a real sense of satisfaction if you manage to sort of tame the terrain on a bike that's kind of a do it all rather than a, hey, this bike is purpose built for this terrain. Um, yeah, you also got to bear in mind the, the other thing between those two bikes is the jump up in wheel size as well. So you're going for the bigger wheels, so you will have slightly slower acceleration, slightly slower deceleration, uh, but you will gain on the sort of momentum over rougher ground. So uh, you could, I mean, although you're going from 170 down to 150, um, yeah, you, I mean, they kind of even out a bit. I'd say the 150-29 will be closer to like a 160-27.5. Um, in comparison to the way it rides, but I think you'll enjoy it. Give it a try, I would. Um, next up from Joe Shatusi. Any suggestions on Tektro brakes continually getting air in the lines? I can bleed them to firm, but after a week or two commuting with the bike, they start getting soft again and barely work. Never had an issue with Shimano on the other bike, but a Trek I have for commuting with Tektro do not stay firm. Um, that suggests to me that there might be a leak there somewhere or perhaps uh, something that a lot of people get wrong accidentally if they trim their hoses down is they don't trim the hose at a proper 90 degree angle. So you know at the end of the hose you have like the olive and the barb go in there. Um, where it goes in it's got to be completely flush on the end of the hose. If there's a little bit of gap like this, that's a little bit of gap that some air can make its way into the system. You have to absolutely foolproof them. And then of course there's the bleeding of the systems as well. Now I haven't actually worked on a set of Tilby brakes, I can confess. I know Neil's got some on his bike, so I'll have to ask him that question to see if he's had the same sort of problems there. But sometimes it can be down to the bleed. Now I've known people using Shimano brakes that have never been able to bleed them like perfectly. They think they've done a great job and after a few rides, one of them will be pumping up. Um, sometimes it is the bleed. So I would definitely go back to basics, try and do a full bleed again. Uh, but if you want to be doubly sure um, before you do that system, um, take it apart and have a look and make sure all the olives are fresh in there. Uh, everything's in the correct order. Things are talked up as they should be. Make sure that everything's at a good angle. Um, yeah, it's difficult when you've got air in a system. So a good way of sort of trying to get some of the air to migrate out of the system is to have your bike up on the end. Um, if you hang your bikes in the evening, it's quite good. If you set your levers uh, to basically 90 degrees down if the bike was on its wheels, so when it's upright, they're completely flat. You can get away with having sort of the master cylinder at the lever open. And if there is any air in the system, um, you can give it a bit of a tap and overnight, you'll find that some of it can migrate out. I've done that before, successfully on bikes have been problematic. I think it was a bike, I don't know what brand brake it was I had on there, but because it had an extreme routing on the inside, there's a bit of a kink, and there used to be like a little bit where air would be trapped on that routing. Um, so that was the problem I had, and I eventually got it out and it bled fine. Um, and it was, it was annoying because I'd bled the brake several times, and there was just one little air pocket in there that you could never get quite right. So there is a slight chance that might be your issue. I mean, I've generally heard good things about Tektro brakes, so um, hopefully you can get it fixed up. Good luck with that. And the last question this week is from Christopher Osterberg. He says, I've experienced a twittering sound from the front of the bike, um, I think, recently. Sounds like I'm being surrounded by twittering birds, sort of like a sort of noise. Haven't been able to localize the sound, but I'm suspecting it could be the brakes, cranks, or fork. 
Um, all right, so there's no point me even trying to guess where it comes from. I just need to uh, give you some info on how to sort of chase that creek. Now, we've also got a video on chasing creeks. Hopefully, that'll be floating around in the links underneath. Uh, you need to sort of figure out when it's happening. Is it happening when you're braking? Is it happening when you're loading the bike? So you need to try it sat down. You need to try it stood up. You need to try it going uphill, downhill. You need to try and sort of remove sort of things like process of elimination from the equation. Uh, also check individual components. So check your spokes. Go around manually feeling your spokes. If there's anything abnormally tight, they can be rubbing together and making a sort of noise that you're describing. Again, if they're abnormally loose, they will lead to a tight spot somewhere else there. So again, you could have that problem. Check the brake hardware, check everything is tight. Check the brake pads aren't rattling too much inside the caliper. Sometimes, like on Shimano brakes, you get the odd pair where the calipers rattle around and that can make that sort of noise as well. Um, check your headset on the bike as well. Make sure that the bearings are sufficiently into the frame. Make sure that they've got grease. If they're in there dry, any movement at all, which can be a minute amount, you can get sort of creaking and tweeting sort of noises. Um, Sorry, I can't do much better than that. I'm hoping that might have helped. Uh, watch the creek chasing video and see if that helps you out. Uh, thanks everyone for watching this week's Ask GMBN Tech, and we'll see you at another show soon. Take care. Ta-ra. Right.